get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Live from the Sweet Snack Show Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. We're live at the Sweet and Snack Show. I bumped into my friend Aaron here. Um, and Aaron, well, first of all, context, Aaron and I play basketball together. He's one of the, the best pure jump shooters I've seen. Um, so I'll start off with that. But you had an article you put out in Food Dive. I want you to talk about what you, what you said in the article. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeremy. So, so yeah, I, I basically work with a lot of food and beverage brands. And what a lot of entrepreneurs notice is that brands can trade for really big valuations or multiples of revenue. And I think it's natural for an entrepreneur to say, hey, you know, how do I stack up, right? How, I see that this brand traded for a 4X or a 5X multiple. Does my brand have what it takes to achieve that kind of an outcome? Yeah. And when you study it and you look at the space, you look at the attributes of the brands that uh, have sold at those kinds of lofty multiples, there are, there are a number of things that I think they have in common. And I think it's insightful for the operators, the investors, or the entrepreneurs themselves um, that have brands that are, are building it and trying to get to that, that great of an outcome. That's why I had to stop you, because when you talk about how do you sell for a greater multiple, that's what every business wants, right? right? And so talk about what you actually do for a second. Sure. So I'm an investment banker. I work with brands in the food and beverage space and I help them run a competitive process that allows them to get the best outcome. Now the best outcome might mean the highest price, that's normally the case, but it can also mean with the right partner that is a good fit, where there's chemistry, there's trust, there's alignment in terms of long-term vision for the business, but it's also the terms and other aspects of, it, of what goes into a transaction, whether that's an acquisition or whether that's a growth capital scenario. What are the ideal companies that you work with? So I, I really focus on better for you brands in the food and beverage space. And it's a really, what do you mean by that? so brands that have products that are allowing consumers to feel good about their choices. So that's not to say that there isn't room for indulgence, but we're seeing a real shift. In fact, the vast majority of the growth in the food sector right now is coming from emerging brands. And a lot of them are featuring things like you know, clean labels, functional benefits in their products. Yeah. Um, they're products that offer convenience or they're on the go or they're frozen. We're seeing a renaissance in frozen right now that we haven't seen in really quite some time. So there's a lot of, of movement towards innovation and towards the future. And the legacy brands that our grandparents uh, purchased at the grocery store, in general, those brands are declining. Um, and so, Or they're buying the brands that you're working with. Well, exactly. So yeah. a lot of the big food companies have outsourced their their research and development to the M&A teams. It's a lot easier to have M&A go in and, and, uh, and do a transaction. And that's where we come in, you know, because we know a lot of these brands. We also know all the strategics and a lot of the, you know, the financial investors that are out there. And we help those brands to, you know, to, to run a competitive process and get, get the best outcome. So what are some of the things in the article that how can people increase their multiple on sale? Sure, sure. So th there are a number of things. I'll pick on some of them. You know, certainly having a brand that is authentic is really important today. We have so much information at our fingertips. You can go on your phone, you can see, you want to understand, what does is, what is this brand stand for? Um, you know, what's the founder's story? That, that means a lot to consumers today. Brand authenticity, does it resonate with that consumer? Yes or no? It's very difficult for the big food companies to replicate that, to create it with a brand that's been around for 100 years. And it's not to say there isn't value for those, those big brands, but what we're seeing with a lot of these entrepreneurial companies is they have that. They have that authenticity. They're starting from the get-go with something that's intrinsically good, and they're trying to positively impact uh, consumers' lives. Yeah. So, so that's so one thing you look for. Thing. We also look at velocity. So when you, when you think about a, a grocery store, a retailer, what they're trying to do is maximize the sales per linear inch of space on the shelf. Okay, And so... Um, 
when you're operating, when you've got a brand, if you're not literate in, in terms of your scanner data, your velocity, your performance, in your space versus your competitive set, you're missing a golden opportunity to really better manage your brand. Um, now, not every, not every brand has the, has the budget to go and purchase this data, but, but many do. And I think it's critically important. So for investors looking at investing in the space, they want to see that a brand can outperform its category because what that means is there's sustainability. They have staying power. If you can get more distribution, well, chances are it's going to do well because it's got good velocity. Right. So authenticity, velocity, what else? I would say gross margins. You know, um, it varies by category, but in general... People out there right now, Aaron, are taking copious notes. I already know, <laughs> so keep going. Yeah. Well, gross margins are really important because there's a lot of brands that will subsidize their growth and slotting fees and promoting and playing that, that game. Um, and that means they might have negative EBITDA for a period of time until they scale and can cross over. But look, if you can generate 40% gross margins as a you know thumb in the wind gross, uh, threshold or higher, that is really important. Investors like to see that. And what that means is as it scales, there will be the opportunity to generate good profitability at the EBITDA line. But what it also means, what it also means is you've got uh, validation that there's something special about your brand and your products that allows you to command a price point that where you can you can generate a healthy gross yeah. margin. And I want to talk about the next one, but uh, I want to stop there for a second because what are you seeing in direct to consumer? Because some people are just uh, you see a trend in just some of these companies not even going retail and going direct to consumer. And is that something you recommend? Something you don't? So there's a lot of there's. Tremendous growth if you can go direct to consumer. I would say food and beverage is probably the last frontier to fully embrace D2C. I mean, we buy as consumers pretty much everything online, but but you know not everything in, in food and beverage is, is sort of there, available. Right. There are a number of companies that have, have uh, uh, pursued a D2C model and have done so effectively. Um, you know, you have the risk, of course, that- It's not you know, as common in the food space. It's not as common. Yeah. I think it's starting to change especially as we as consumers get more accustomed to buying products yeah. online. Uh, so I think, it, it, look, it can be a very valuable channel. Um, you, you have that direct relationship with the customer. Um, your margins can be better. Um, there are some risks, of course. Um, but, but no, I think it's an attractive avenue. There are a lot of brands that try to have a balanced approach. Maybe they started going direct, but then they're, they're crossing over into retail, or maybe it's vice versa. Right. So what else is powerful in the article? Uh, yeah, I would say um, I would say th when you think about your business and you think about the future potential, what investors are looking for is does this brand have the ability to scale? You know, so so if you're a 50 million revenue business today, can it be can it be 100, 200, 300, or more? And how, and if so, what's your what's your conviction as an entrepreneur about your plan to go and, and make that happen? Right. How are you going to do it? Is it through more distribution? Is it going to be through extending your brand into other adjacent categories? Every business has a different plan in place, but I would I would say you know that's where we can come in. We work with founders, we work with owners of businesses to develop that plan and to articulate that when they're getting ready to sell their business. Yeah. So they need to have a direct plan for scaling and give that possible acquiring company and upside and what the future looks like? But there's a word of caution. One of the things I talk about is it's really important to focus on your core. One of the traps a lot of entrepreneurs fall into is they try to do too much too quickly. They have ideas, you know, I want to do this product and that product and that. And before you know it, it's hard to have focus. And I think it's important for a strategic buyer in particular to see that there's a focus on the core, I call them power skews. And Go prove it out. Go go expand your your ACV, your distribution for those power SKUs, and then innovate. Launch the next line. Prove that out. It's okay. It doesn't mean you can't have lots of ideas. It doesn't mean you can't have a product roadmap or pipeline. I think that's critically important. But take it in in steps. And these are these are generalizations. There's yeah. there's many examples of people that that have uh, yeah. gone and gone really broad and have been successful. But whether it's what's the uh, typical advice you hear as far as Focusing in because it, especially resources wise too like you spread yourself too thin that that you get but, people in trouble too But it's a balancing act because if you want to get credit for your your next idea your next product line that your extension a Buyer is going to say well Prove to me that it can do well prove to me number one that your brand can travel beyond your core Yeah, but then prove to me that this idea that you have right. is gonna they want, act, both. they want both yeah, so what, what I would say is focus on the core but 
start testing some of the newer ideas that you have on a small scale as as that initial yeah. uh, you know power skew or pro core product line is is rolling out start to think about the next thing and the more you're able to demonstrate that it has legs then you'll get credit for it so Aaron um, I don't know if you can talk about this if there's like NDAs or whatever don't but I'm curious from your path what's been some interesting stories that you some um, companies you've worked with sure. and what happened and if you don't can't mention names, just say no, no, in general, right, whatever. But right. I think it'd be interesting just to hear one or two of those. Yeah. So one example, a recent transaction where I advised was Bantam Bagels. So for those that don't know it, this is a uh, a frozen uh, company, frozen food company. They started with mini bagel balls, and you may be familiar with them in Starbucks. And um, Shark Tank. And Shark Tank. Yeah. It was a husband and wife team. Uh, Nick and Elise Oluksak uh, started this business. And uh, they quit their jobs on Wall Street because uh, Nick had the idea in a, in a dream one night uh, for bagel balls stuffed with cream cheese. And they opened up a... Uh, I don't dream about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. But they, 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 went, they went for it. And the thing took off. They got on Shark Tank, did a deal with Lori, got into Starbucks nationwide. They're the only third-party brand, to my knowledge, in the bakery set at Starbucks, which is really quite an accomplishment. People then tried it, loved it, and said, well, where can I buy it elsewhere? And so that drove pull through demand into grocery stores. Um, once they got into grocery, I started talking to them, ran a process. They were looking to bring on a, an investor to do a, an investment, but they were also considering a strategic buyer. But one of their big things was, how, we, you know, we see so much growth ahead for this business. How do we as operators of this business continue to benefit from that upside? We ended up selling the business to a publicly traded company, strategic buyer, Team Marzetti. And you know, it's a home run outcome for everybody. Everyone's happy. Nick and Lee's continue to run the business, they do, which, is, yeah. which is rare these days. Is. Um, Marzetti really wants them to be entrepreneurs, and they want that to, frankly, their entrepreneurial hustle and spirit to percolate their organization. Yeah. So it's a great outcome. So let's point people, thank you for sharing that. Let's point people towards your article that you wrote so people can check it out. And anywhere else, yep. uh, they should check you out. And um, at the end, I want to talk about um, you know, who should be contacting you? Like what level should they be at if they want to work with you or do something with you? So let's first point them towards your article and anywhere else online. Okay. Yeah, so the article is, uh, it was picked up by Food Dive under their op-eds. So feel free to go to Food Dive's website and the op-ed section and you'll see it in there. And then it's also on uh, uh, our website. I work for Lincoln International. We're a mid-market investment bank, a global firm. And you can go to uh, Aaron Goldstein, you can go to my bio, and it should be linked right there. Yeah, there should be a tagline, best pure jump shooter <laughs> there. Um, so who should be reaching out to? Yeah, so I would say if you are uh, the uh, owner of a, of a business in the food and beverage space, and you're thinking about raising some capital, you're thinking about uh, selling your business yeah. at some point down the road, I'd love to talk to you. What ha level should they be at? You know, I, I, I talk to companies when they're very early. One of the dynamic things about the sector is companies can scale very, very quickly. Yeah. But in general, we're selling businesses that have enterprise values from you know, 40, 50 million on the, on the low end to five, six, 700 million. We'll go above that as well when we start to kind of run into you know, larger investment banks at that point. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Check it out. Thanks, guys. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.